to roll your uppercut Try to hit me in the gut Thinking that I won't react You whisper in my name Thinking I won't be the same To conviction in effect See what you didn't know Who's the style I never show Slipping on your every jab So tighten up your fist Step into the ring with this I hope your mama's got your back I took a break You're making a huge mistake Thinking you can take the throne Look at your trembling Step into the lion's den Bet you wish you stayed at home Begging for mercy underneath your breath When I ain't even sweating Yet my legend's written in the stone Yeah Your crying age in defeat Is now your only friend Even your mama's gotta know This is Ben. Ben Gillette, Ben and Teller. Big guy does magic. Smaller guy next to me, he does magic too. He doesn't talk that much. Anyway, I wanted to welcome you to In Time. Welcome you all to In Time with Nick. Love you all. Peace. Go get him, Nick.
Hello, hello, and welcome everyone to In Time. My name is Nicholas Lamar Souter. Uh, thank you for joining us. It's In Time on Overtime, at least some of the time. Uh, we are here. This is this is going to be an interesting show. I've been looking forward to this one. We're going to be discussing uh, Peter Zehan. We've been uh, uh, thinking about this for a while, and his videos have been floating around. I've had a number sent to me, and people have said, you know, uh, gee, uh, what do you think about the guy? Uh, and, uh, my opinions are mixed. Uh, I think everybody's opinions here are mixed. We've all talked about it. So, uh, we're going to get into the show, uh, in just a minute here, and we're going to start to go over the video. This video that we're covering today is his video on, uh, Ukraine, and it's part of a larger, uh, talk that he did. The full talk is down at the bottom. It's about an hour and uh, a half, maybe two hours. Uh, he's got a lot of these talks out there, and I've watched a number of them now, and we're going to comment on different sections of them. He is a geopolitical strategist, uh, highly regarded in many circles, so we're going to try to figure out sort of... Oh, I'm getting uh, backgrounds down there from somewhere. All right, and uh, we're going to sort of try to figure out uh, what at least we think about it and uh, do this, uh, his overview on Ukraine. So uh, we're going to get into that in a minute. Again, we are uh, simulcasting on in time and overtime. We do this for two reasons. The first is because it really sticks a craw in our uh, head mods. Um, <coughs> well, anyway, um, it... it you know, and so that's kind of an added bonus and more incentive to do these kinds of shows at any time uh, we possibly can. Also, uh, it, it's content that works for both overtime and in time, and we are still trying to grow the overtime channel. So if you can like, subscribe, and share this content, if you like what we have to say, if you feel you learned something about him or something about Ukraine and Russia, and there's going to be a lot to discuss. He talks fast. This is going to this show is going to cover a lot of material in a reasonably short period of time. Uh, if you feel like you've learned something and you have friends who you think would want to uh, see it and would find it useful as well, pass it along. It does them a favor. It does you a favor. It does us a favor. So it's just a, a free way to help. You can also become a patron. You can become a member, and we really appreciate it. Our goal right now is to get overtime to a 1,000 subs. Once that's done, our lives become a lot easier, and in time and overtime can operate much more <laughs> independently. And uh, perhaps... Most importantly, it makes our head mods life a lot easier. So all that notwithstanding with me today is Isandering and uh, Lance McMillan. How are you gentlemen doing? Great. Yeah, doing, doing fine. All right. Well, so uh, just before we start this, uh, these videos have been going around. Uh, I, I don't remember, uh, Commander, I had sent you his China video, which we're going to be doing next week. Uh... But when we uh, when we each looked at it, I think we we had a, a number of, of well, I'm not sure. Maybe we shouldn't poison the well by by giving opinions first. So maybe you know what I'm gonna th think I'm gonna do at this point. I'm gonna go into it. So let's uh, start with the video, and then we'll talk about. Um, well, at least let's tell you what. Here's what I think we should do. Let's, the um, Russians control. Here you go. This we is... discussed this beforehand. I swear. <laughs> So let's actually, at a minimum, um, uh, do you gentlemen just want to tell me what your first impressions were when you heard of the guy or, or saw him uh, talking on uh, these topics? I guess my first uh, my first thought was this seems in uh, a little oversimplified. All right, Commander? Yeah, kind of. Um, I, I, I thought he had a lot of interesting things to say. I agreed with much of it, but there were enough subtle nuances that didn't seem to be accurate to me that it bothered me. And then on rewatching it, it's the, the pace, the manner of speaking that he's using that I found really kind of set my antenna twitching as to something isn't quite right here. He, he comes across in a lot of ways to me like a, uh, you know, a con man or a snake oil salesman. Now, that said, I don't want to say he is that. I'm just saying that's the style he's using to speak. The guy's credentials, in my opinion, are impressive, if not impeccable. So he does know what he's talking about. All right. And I appreciate that caveat. So, and that was sort of uh, that you had put, I had objections that I had a difficult time 
vocalizing. I since have found sort of what my principal objection is, but it was based very much on what you had said, which I think you put far better than me, which is he he feels there's there's something about it which felt off, but on the flip side, uh, by my understanding of the topics I've seen him talk about, I've never seen him say something that was inaccurate, at least at that time. Now I may have a few more, but okay. So it sounds like it sounds like in general we're in agreement that we've we've had some concerns, but he does have uh, good credentials and he seems to have uh, a pretty good command of these topics on on uh, at least one level. Is that something we could all agree on? Yeah. Sure. More all more right. so than me. All right. So uh, let us begin. This is uh, from, again, a larger talk. Now, this this clip that we have does go a bit into Germany just because he, he he's talking oil and the Nord Stream pipeline. So we're going to let it go a little bit into into his discussion of Germany. We will be saving that for another time if, if we decide we'd like to continue doing these. I think these are worthwhile. And because he's not a stupid man and because he does uh, really seem to have a, a pretty good mastery of a lot of this material, I think it's very worth um, hearing what he has to say. But we'll, we'll discuss it. Uh, uh, as we go. So uh, that being said, uh, let's um, start with his presentation again. And the link to the full one is in the description, both on in time and over time. Uh, so let's begin. What we're looking at here is a map of the Russian space. We have to start with the war. On the left, you've got a combined climate and uh, economic map. And on the right, you have a population density map. So let's start on the right. The lighter color of orange that's going from roughly Central Europe down into Central Siberia that is where everybody lives. Now, if you will notice on the left, it overlays with the green. That is the Russian wheat belt. That's where you grow everything. Now, this is not a particularly great place to be. And there's not a lot of people here. So that lighter color of orange, that's roughly the population de density of Nebraska. The green zone, the wheat belt, is really, really crappy land. In fact, in terms of global agricultural basins, it's the least productive of them in the world. And it's because of the weather. In the summer, it's roughly the same as Western Kansas, so hot, dry. And in the winter, it's about the same as Northeastern Alberta, so cold, dry, windy. You can grow one Let's pause here. wheat. So I want to go back and point something out the maps are confusing at first glance because they are not oriented north at the top. They're oriented with west at the top. So it becomes a little clearer for people to understand what he's trying to talk about when you twist them on their sides and look at them from that perspective. So for example, this one, if you twist it, uh, which, let me, uh... Yeah, Nick so is, let me, Nick is trying to do. <laughs> let me uh, also, turn also the, it's good to point out that white is water. Yeah. All right, so no, let me you're, um you're upside one, down. two. There we go. There you go. Okay. And let's make that a little bigger. I don't know. It's interesting that turning it shrinks it, but there yeah. you go. This I recognize. Okay. I really was confused earlier. Now I'm not so confused. Right. So. To, to orient people, I want to point out a few features. Number one, you can see the Black Sea down there uh, in kind of the middle of the lower left portion of the picture. Uh, you can also see the Caspian Sea somewhat to the right or to the east of that. And then if you go up from there, you see a kind of grayed out area right in the middle. That grayed out area is the Ural Mountains. That's important because the Ural Mountains really delineate European from Asian Russia. So if you want to zoom back out again, you can see kind of what I'm talking about. Now, as he'll mention, the blue areas, that's basically permafrost. It's Tiaga. It's unusable for any purposes. It's, it's just too damn cold. The yellow areas that you see in the southern end of that picture, those are all deserts. Again, you can't plant on them. So 
everything in green is where the bulk of the agriculture occurs. The stuff in the kind of grayish tan, that's marginal land, land that doesn't really have good agricultural qualities, but it does allow for some agriculture. I wanted to point out two things uh, over by Ukraine. If you look on Ukraine's eastern border, there's a kind of gray-looking question mark that comes up. That is the Donbass. Again, not much agriculture going on there. However, that is, or at least used to be, the industrial heartland of Russia and the Ukraine. So it's important because that's where all that important industrial infrastructure was built. In World War II, when the Germans attacked, the Russians simply picked all of those factories up and moved them to the east beyond the Ural Mountains. The trouble is, you can pick up all the tools and machine presses and drills and all that kind of stuff, but you cannot pick up and transport an iron ore smelter or blast furnace. Those stayed. And those are still there and are a major part of why that area is so valuable for the Russians to try to continue to hold. It's where much of the heavy industry is still located. The other part is if you look at the border between Ukraine and Belarus, there's another gray area. Those are the Pirpet Marshes. You can't really get through the Pirpet Marshes except on a few very narrow roads or railways. Now, later on, I don't want to steal uh, Zeon's thunder here, but he's going to talk about the, uh, the roots of approach, the, the roots that invading forces have attacked Russia. Those are the blue arrow things that you see there. So I'll let him speak to that, but I wanted to point out where those people can understand what he's talking about. And, and I think one of the most important things, because it took me a while, I, I didn't actually, I, I realized I was looking at the map and my brain just kept going, uh, 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 yeah. I couldn't figure out what was going on. And yeah, so the maps that we're going to see in this presentation, they're the actual maps that he had put up in his presentation, have been rotated, um, uh, what is it, he's rotated them clock. Count, no, counterclockwise uh, three times. It's, it's, they're off. And as Commander McMillan said, um, the West is at the top. Uh, we have reoriented this to be a bit more familiar. Uh, you're going to see this map again. When you do, uh, just keep in mind that uh, the North is, I think, to your right uh, in, in the map going forward. So, um, all right, let's, um, uh, let's, put this map down and we will uh, continue with his presentation. He was talking about uh, wheat and uh, their issues uh, um, in terms of agriculture. Since it's the least productive of them in the world and it's because of the weather. In the summer it's roughly the same as western Kansas, so hot, dry. And in the winter it's about the same as northeastern Alberta, so cold, dry, windy. You can grow one wheat crop and you have to kind of race to get it into the ground after the last frost and race to get it before the first frost because those two dates are only about three and a half months apart. And the income that you get from that one wheat crop is so low per acre that Russia has never been able to build a road network. If you want to move anything within the Russian space at scale, you have to do it by rail. Now, on the map on the left, if you go to the okay. right, let's, let's to the north, to the blue, you are in tundra and... Oh, yes. I want, to, I want to talk about a couple of things that he said here that make me uncomfortable. All right. Number one, he talks about this being the least productive agricultural land in the world. And yet, Russia and Ukraine are two of the top exporters of agricultural product in the world. Mm. So, one of those statements isn't Accurate. Okay. Or they're making well, up for it. Well, to play devil's but, advocate. Sure. Um, 
yeah, yeah. Which I which I don't know. I don't know enough yeah. about their agriculture, but yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. So I, I did some re- there's a difference between yeah. being between uh, how productive your land is and where you fall in the export market. It's like they they uh, I think it's uh, Russia beats us in wheat exports yet our per acre production of wheat is far higher than theirs. I, I'm not disagreeing with that, but the the key thing to understand is they're basically we'll call them four tiers with regards to, and I'm just using wheat because that's the primary crop they grow in this area. But when you talk wheat, there's tier one who between them, these two countries produce 30% of the entire global wheat production, China and India. And yet they don't export any of it. It's almost entirely consumed domestically. The next tier, tier two, are the exporters. The five largest exporters of wheat in order are Russia, the United States, Australia, Canada, and Ukraine. Together, those five countries account for 27% of the global production of wheat. And the third tier are basically countries who are really the biggest importers. And I only took a selection of them, uh, but I wanted you to get an impression of what we're talking. These are the people who literally cannot survive if somebody isn't selling them wheat. Indonesia, Egypt, Turkey, Algeria, Bangladesh, Nigeria. These and other countries like them really have to have wheat to survive. And the fourth tier, which we don't need to get into, is everybody else who kind of produces enough for their own use, but they don't have enough to export. Uh, so they're, they're kind of a middle tier. And the reason this is important, I think, is because you I don't think it's say, uh, fair to say that you get this, we... we are looking at some of the worst agricultural land. Yeah, perhaps, but it's still hugely important, and it is an export product. It's not like these are people who are uh, subsistence farmers just eking out a living. Mm. They're producing enough to sell on the international market and make a significant profit for the state. The other thing that is interesting is he said if you overlay the population map over this, yes, the area that the majority of the Russian people live in corresponds very closely to that green wheat belt area. But what he doesn't say and what the other map doesn't clearly show is that it, uh, there's a distinct both east and west of the Urals divide and a big big divide between urban and rural populations. So a significant portion of of the Russian population are urban dwelling, and so it doesn't matter whether they're in the green or the brown or wherever. The, the, The rural population are what matters, and the vast bulk of them are on the uh, the western side of the Urals, and even in fact, if you cut uh, the western side of Russia in half, the bulk of them are living on the western side of that. Um, and okay. we have a real quick. We have a, a two dollar super chat um, uh, from Sinister Porpoise. Happy Pi Day. Um, I once tried to set it to uh, 3.2. Uh, yeah, today's, I forgot today was pie day, and I was supposed to make a grasshopper pie for my wife's, because um, uh, I make a mean grasshopper pie, she's going to bring it into work, but uh, we got hit with a snowstorm, everybody snowed in, but that is, uh, I completely forgot. So thank you very much, uh, Sinister, for your super chat. We really appreciate uh, that, and um, so, um, uh all right. So thank you. And uh, so let's get, uh, is Andrew, unless there's something you wanted to add to that, we can, uh, let's uh, uh, go forward. No, we can go forward. All right. 
Uh, da, da, da. Take I'll pause completely. this right after he finishes about the roads and the, the approach routes. All right. No one lives there. If you go to the left, to the yellow, to the south, you're in desert. No one lives there. But the real fun in games, and the reason why the Russians drink so much, is the beige on the shoulders. Territories that even by the Russian definition are completely economically useless, but you could still shove a panzer division through that because it's flat. Russia has been invaded 50 odd times in its history. And every time a foreigner has made it to the green, the Russians have never driven them back. The weather has. Because the Russians can't move in their own space, but any foe who managed to get there clearly can cross distances at speed. So the only way the Russians have ever discovered that they can survive in their own neighborhood is to expand out of the green through the beige until they reach a series of geographic barriers that you can't run a Mongol horde through. And then they forward position their very, very slow moving troops in the footprints between those barriers. Plug the gaps. During the Soviet period, the Russians controlled every single one of those plugs. Post-Soviet Russia only controlled one. And everything that Vladimir Putin has done in foreign affairs since 1999 has been about repositioning that forward defensive perimeter. This is the Karabakh War, the Kazakh intervention, the Donbass War, the Crimea War, the Georgian War. He's about halfway done. The question has never been... All right, was there... So, uh, yeah, yeah. I was going to say, go, go back to the properly oriented map. All right. Uh, so let's get uh, that up here. There we go. Okay. So he's referring to the blue areas, uh, the blue arrows, I should say, as the areas where Russia is historically been vulnerable to external attack. Except some of the areas that he's talking about really a aren't where they are or b don't exist at all so let's start from the top and work around in a counterclockwise fashion no no just stay where you were that's fine oh okay so he talks he talks about the the one up there by finland um the the white sea arrow you've zoomed too far out to see it there you oh, go uh, yeah. okay I'll, I'll give us a little more room there there we go yep Right. Historically, that's been used precisely once and nothing happened with it. And it was used precisely once because that was during the Russian Civil War and the pro-Tsarist anti-Bolshevik faction invited a small contingent of Western troops to come in and protect the ports that had been used to supply Russia with war materials up in the far north. So I don't think that one actually counts as a valid threat axis. Mm. The next one, which is the Baltic Sea axis, there hasn't ever been a Baltic Sea, cross-Baltic Sea attack. They either come down out of Finland or they come up northwards out of Poland towards St. Petersburg. So that arrow really is confusing when you look at it. The next one is the Polish Gap. This is the single most threatening approach route into Russia. And it's because it literally drives straight through the heartland, that green portion just above the Pirpet Marshes, straight towards Russia or straight up towards St. Petersburg. That's the one they've always been most concerned with. The next one is the one that you see called Bessarabian Gap. Let me, let me, inter let me interrupt real quick. That's also the one they can do the least about. So even if they can go through right. Ukraine, plug the other twos, plug the... Uh, unless they want to fight NATO, which I don't think they want to... I mean, I, and I'm not being sarcastic here. I, I, I genuinely don't think that's on their agenda. I don't see how they close that one. So that does seem to me like it might make some of these points moot. Exactly. What what you're saying is exactly the point, which is the single most threatening axis of uh, advance from their mortal enemy, which is the West, 
is actually the one they can't defend against. So the whole goal has always been, we've got to occupy Poland to prevent other people from using Poland to attack us. That's why every war seems to go back and forth across Poland multiple times, because Poland is what the Russians think they need to defend themselves, and anybody who wants to attack the Russians has to go through Poland. The next one is the Best Arabian Gap coming up out of Romania into Ukraine. Uh, there's a big river there, the, uh, the Danube, among others. It's really tough to get across there, and once you do, then you're into Ukraine. And that, again, is pretty wide open, flat country that you can just advance across without too much problem. So that one needs to be considered. Separating the Bessarabian and the Polish gaps, that's the Carpathian and Transylvanian Alps in there. And you can't really fight across that. So those become two very distinct and separate routes of advance. The arrow going into the Crimea, I don't understand why that's there. The only time that's really been used is the uh, the famous Crimean War in the 1850s, and it took two years of fighting for the combined uh, British, French, Sardinian, and Ottoman forces at great cost to take one city. Mm. So, and as you look at the map, there's only one way out of Crimea, and it's a very, very narrow land bridge. So it's fairly easy to defend against that. That's not a route of attack into the Russian heartland. I don't know why it's there. Okay. The one coming up the Black Sea coast, the one coming up the Caspian coast, those aren't either because you're in mountainous areas coming through those. There isn't really a safe, easy access point to get through. So that's the one the Russians pretty much control and, and can block right now. The one that isn't shown on the map is somewhat to the east, and that's the one coming out of Afghanistan. I can't think of a single historical instance where somebody attacked Russia through Afghanistan. So and in then your there's view, the whole China one your... over there, but I don't... Well, yeah, I'm well, and you know, um, well, and they're allies with China, but I can still see, I suppose, if you're paranoid. Um, all right. So, in your view, basically, it sounds like there's uh, he may have a point about there are access points, but there's probably fewer than half of what they're talking about that's a concern, and one of them yeah. is probably a huge concern. But there's, the, the, uh, practically speaking, uh, there appears to be nothing they can do about it. Is that is that roughly accurate? Yeah. The, yeah. The two biggest threats, if you want to look at it from the the standpoint of a a Russian imperialist who wants to defend Holy Mother Russia. The two biggest threats are the one coming from Romania and the one coming from Poland. And they can't do a damn thing about those because they're already NATO part, uh, partners. If you attack them, then all of Western Europe gets on your case. So it, it, it makes no sense to have gone for a military solution when the only safe, intelligent approach would have been a diplomatic solution. All right, all right. So let's. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, let's take that down. I'm going to wind this back just a smidge, and uh, we'll continue through. And then they forward position their very, very slow-moving troops in the footprints between those barriers. Plug the gaps. During the Soviet period, the Russians controlled every single one of those plugs. Post-Soviet Russia only controlled one. And everything that Vladimir Putin has done in foreign affairs since 1999 has been about repositioning that forward defensive perimeter. This is the Karabakh War, the Kazakh intervention, the Donbass War, the Crimea War, the Georgian War. He's about halfway done. The question has never been Will Russia stop before it has all of Ukraine? See, Russia and Ukraine, 
Ukraine doesn't control the gaps. Ukraine is on the way to the gaps. So the question has always been, how long will it take the Russians to reposition after they've conquered all of Ukraine and go to the next line of countries, which include Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Romania, and Poland? The scale of what the Russians are trying to do here, we have a hard time wrapping our mind around it. I mean, the United States is a big country, but the Russians have three times the borders and half the population. If they can't forward position, they die. It's very, very simple. This war was always going to happen. Okay, so that's the big strategic picture. Let's look at the tactical picture. The dotted Gosh. lines on this map are those all-important rail connections. <laughs> I was going to ask you about that too. Yeah, okay. War Again with that sideway easy. Mac. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is whatever. So, yeah, north is, yeah. He said... War was always going to happen. No. It didn't need to happen. The reality is, we've just come to the conclusion of one of the longest periods of peace in European history. European history is punctuated with war, war, war. And since World War II, there's really been nothing. All the countries are getting along. They're even talking about, you know, forming a union. Uh, they have this big defensive treaty organization. There was nothing that was an existential threat at the moment to Russia or the Russian government. The Russians were profiting hugely off of doing capitalist business with the West. Why did they do this? It has something else going on than they didn't feel safe. That's what I find so bizarre with the, the, the statement that the war was inevitable. What, what, with a I rational a... set of actors, it wouldn't have been. And that's the true rub. You needed rational actors. Well, that, that I concur with. So I concur with rational actors. It wouldn't have been. I'm not sure that Putin is a rational actor. I think he is under many circumstances and one of the more rational and pragmatic ones in a while. But I think when it comes to certain things, uh, uh, possibly not. I think he's also stuck in a, 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 a 1980s, 1990s Cold War mindset when things have, have moved on. But that notwithstanding, given the circumstances of who's in charge of Russia and how Russia is organized at the present, I actually tend to agree, and I'd be curious to see what you think about this statement, I tend to agree that, yes, war in Ukraine was always inevitable, um, because I don't think Russia could let it go. And I think once Russia realized just how far it had gone, they're like, no, 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 you're mine, come back. Um, and I think that was inevitable, but I don't think it was inevitable for the reasons he thinks it was inevitable for all the reasons that you had outlined um, just about five minutes ago. If, if that makes any sense. Yeah, it, it does. The way I look at it is prior to the invasion, most Ukrainians used Russian as their language that they spoke in their homes. Yes. They may have spoken some Ukrainian, but for the most part, they're Russian speakers. If you simply allow what I would call cultural imperialism to run its course because of the border, because of families intermarrying, there, there's not a, a strong likelihood you're going to see any real threat materializing from that direction. And you could exploit it uh, instead of you know, all the money they've invested in, in a conventional war, instead invest that in you know, improving relations, strengthening ties, creating a uh, indelible link between the Ukrainian and Russian economies so that they really wouldn't be able to break away and go to the West. All of that could have been done, but that wasn't the way these people thought. This isn't the way they want to think. To them, it's, you know, my manly future is all about crushing you with a tank, otherwise I'm not really a man. Hmm. 
All right, let's uh, go forward. The deep red were the territories that the Russians controlled at the end of the last war in 2014. So anyone who says if you just give the Russians a little bit of land, they'll stop, uh, no. This is the seventh time they've done this since 1999. So, you know, and then the pink areas are the territories that the Russians occupied as of the 1st of September. Now, you guys remember back to the beginning of the war in the very first week when we saw that giant 40 mile long convoy of military vehicles coming from Belarus south to Kiev. And then on the fourth day of the war, that convoy stopped because they forgot fuel trucks. And on the seventh day of the war, the soldiers got out of the equipment and walked back to Belarus because they also forgot food. Everyone I've talked to at the Defense Department and every NATO defense ministry had the same general position. Like, holy crap, the Russians do not know how to fight a war anymore. They have forgotten. They are doing worse than the Iraqis did in 1992 in Desert Storm. If NATO forces and Russian forces meet on the field of battle, they will be obliterated. It will be a thousand to one casualty ratio. All right. I'm going to pause hey. here. I have two questions, uh, <laughs> two, two comments. Sure. <laughs> um, first, um, I... I I think when you're speaking and when you're especially speaking to an audience, sometimes you have to speak in shorthand. And so you yes. make generalizations that you know are not entirely accurate. But uh, that may have been what he was doing when he said, well, they had to leave because they ran out of food and they ran out of water. My understanding was the principal failure of that column was not a, a lack of food and water, although that contributed, but it was a lack of maintenance on any of the vehicles. And the reason they were continually slowing down, they didn't run out of these yeah. things. It's that the vehicles could not be maintained, uh, the, the, all the rubber gaskets and everything because they hadn't been actually using these vehicles and maintaining them, a dry rod on everything. The wheels were coming off. Everything was coming off because of a lack of maintenance. And then eventually it stopped. And then, yeah, eventually they had to yeah. leave because it's like they couldn't keep that that column supplied but it was stopped not from a lack of food and water and in this case while i understand making generalizations and that kind of generalization okay i get it but that's off enough from the reality you could have just said because of maintenance yeah. issues and i'm that's mildly concerning the other well, one is the thousand to one ratio number but yeah please yeah now the the thing that bothered me about that is exactly what you said is it it's trying to say that they're stupid they forgot to bring gas yes. and food no that's not what happened what happened is that the corruption that's endemic that's it's system wide throughout russia is what brought the army to a screeching halt because nothing worked that's what stop the war right? that and ukrainian soldiers fighting really hard and understanding that the primary target wasn't shooting in the tank it was shooting that fuel truck it was shooting that ammunition carrier because when they're gone the tanks and the artillery can't really function anymore that's this is one of those yeah this is one of those points where i'm like yeah this was a bit oversimplified i mean they, he did there it was the situation was far more complex than than just oh they forgot to bring fuel and food uh, so yeah it was just that one of the examples of it just seemed a bit oversimplified uh same thing with the the different mountain passes it's nuanced but i'd call it um um uh oh geez now i just forgot what i was going to uh grossly um uh, uh, not misstated, but, um, oversimplified. It, yeah. Well, it's, it's, um, it, it's to the point where he genuinely should have known better because he is representing Russians as having failed in a way that they didn't. And what you, what you, I like what you said. He's basically saying they're, they're really stupid and idiotic. Yeah. They should have had maintenance. They should have, but these are all systemic problems that we've talked about and we knew were coming. It, it, it it's, um, it, it's, it's almost a gross negligence. I don't know. It's he should not be saying this, in my view. Uh, there is some truth to it, but not enough to justify the the context he's putting it in and what he's saying. They ran out of food uh, and water there because they were stuck there because the vehicles didn't work for completely different reasons than what he's talking about. And it's a it's a it's a significant misattribution, in my view. Yeah. So he's, the he's also a about Please. to start talking about why this 
threatened to verge into an existential battle for Russia's existence. And when that's finished, stop again, because I want to talk about that. And he is correct. Everybody was shocked. And he's saying this right now. Everybody at the DOD, everybody in NATO was shocked at how bad they were and how poorly oh. they were fighting. That's absolutely true. He's right. He's right. Yes. I. He says in a, in a conventional war, the ratio of casualties would be a thousand to one. I find that that's another one where you throw out a number like that. I become very suspicious because I'm like, I don't, I cannot see how that could possibly be true. But they'd be high in our favor. Very high. But a thousand to one is so high that it it, it seems absurd it, to the point. Yeah, yeah, it's ridiculously overstated. I think at at absolute best you knock one zero off of that, and I would still argue you probably need to divide by two or three to even bring it into the realm of possible. Well, and then that concerns me because you could easily say he's using hyperbole, which he uses and uh, quite amusingly, like he's like, and the reason why Russians drink so much, it's like nobody thinks that that's really the reason why. Um, so, you know, he could be using it for hyperbolic effect, but this gets into sort of my biggest objection, which is you're never entirely sure with him where he's using sort of hyperbole and opinion versus facts of which he's also got a command of a good number of things that I think are indisputable. So it's sort of... Uh, it gets yep. foggy in a way I don't like. All right, I will stop this uh, when uh, after uh, at that next segment. We will destroy them as a conventional power in a matter of weeks. And this made no one happy. Because for the Russians, this is a battle for their existential survival. They can't stop, they won't stop. Which means nukes are on the table. And if we have a conventional fight, there will be a nuclear exchange. So the decision was made very, very early in the war that the Russian military had to be destroyed here, now forever is that a good spot yeah so it's important to understand that it's less a question of existential battle it's not like you know nato is going to go in and start committing genocide of ukraine or excuse me of russian uh, civilians but I think you need to realize the mindset that the Russian military has had since the Cold War. And I don't mean after, I mean during. Which was that, and we know this from captured, uh, or not captured, but turned over to us, war plans that they gave their Warsaw Pact partners, the East Germans, the communist governments of you know Hungary and Poland and so forth. Their war plan for a possible NATO versus war pact confrontation called for the release and use of over 900 nuclear warheads on the first day of the conflict. That's what's being talked about here, I think. And he, he's not making that entirely clear. It's that the way the Russian military thinks is that in the event of a war with NATO, the only way to survive is to go nuke full on right from the start. Now, we're not talking a strategic nuclear t exchange. We're not taking ICBMs hitting L.A., Chicago, and New York. We're talking, you know, smaller weapons being used against airfields, rail crossings, key bridges, that kind of stuff throughout Europe. So it may not destroy the U.S., but it's certainly going to leave Europe, Western Europe, a giant glowing gopher hole. Yeah, but if he does that, it will destroy the U.S. because the U.S. is obligated Ex to, yeah. Right, exactly, because the only way we can respond to something like that is by saying, okay, game over, man. <laughs> Well, I, I'm not sure. I Game think what he's over, man. To... Game <laughs> over. Yeah. I think what he's trying to say is, I, okay, so look, so people have mentioned that Ukraine is a strategic national interest for um, Russia. And what they mean by that is, uh, although you would understand this better than I, uh, but what they usually mean by that is, and it's, it's not, by the way, a strategic national interest for 
the U.S., although I've argued actually in a circuitous way it kind of is, but it is certainly not in the same way that it is uh, for Russia. And what that is to, me, uh, to say is, well, look, if it becomes a part of NATO, they feel like they're threatened because NATO is actively trying to wipe out Russia. That is actually completely true. Uh, NATO's been trying to wipe out Russia for a very long time, but we're doing it in the exact way that you talked about, which is economically, culturally, if we ex ex uh, project our uh, even, and even cultural power. If the people decide that they like Americans enough, it's going to become very hard uh, to maintain a, a anti-American stance. Uh, and the the idealism or the ideals of the former Soviet Union all sort of wash away. We've had some success with that when we practice it properly in other countries. We're actually more successful than people, I think, understand in Tehran. would have been nice if certain tangerine-colored... Um, uh, Presidents were aware of that, but at any rate, um, I'm not bitter at all. Um, no. So, <laughs> no. Um, at at any rate, uh, I, I it's it's it seems to me if it joins NATO and they keep losing Soviet satellite states, former Soviet satellite states to NATO, I can see why if I were Putin, I would say this could be an end to us. Now, it wouldn't be an end. Uh, nobody's going to talk about going in and killing all Russians, but it would be an end to this kind of culture, which he absolutely prizes. And in a couple of generations, maybe. And is that the goal? Yes, that's. I think that's the goal of NATO. I think they're deliberately doing it. But um, it's not an existential threat in a physical sense. And I don't... So it really depends on where his head is at as to just how far he'd go to win in Ukraine. But I think um, Zahan's argument here is uh, he will go to any length to win at Ukraine, period, end of discussion. I don't think he's right. I hope he's not right, but I think that's his argument. Yeah, I think that's a fair statement. All right. Um so let's con so uh, what he just said here was so NATO's reply is at this point the only way to stop this is to end the Russian army in its entirety now and forever, but without a single NATO soldier because then we would have the obliteration and the nukes would fly. So any weapon system that the Ukrainians can prove that they can competently operate, they can have. And to expand the list of things that they can competently operate, 60,000 uh, 60, Ukrainian troops are already trained in NATO countries right now. 15,000 have already been deployed back to Ukraine. And with every month, the technological capacity for them to absorb weapons increases. That was our lesson. The Russians had their own. When it became apparent that the Ukrainians were fighting back, the Russian lesson was, well, crap, maybe we shouldn't have drank all of that Kool-Aid that we made. If the Ukrainians are not going to welcome us as liberators, then instead of being a non-issue, the civilians suddenly are a problem that we have to deal with. So we're going to dust off a strategy that we perfected well before World War I, that we've used in Chechnya and Syria. And we're going to advance very slowly under a hail of artillery, destroying not anything that moves, but instead anything that stands. Because if we can obliterate all civilian infrastructure, especially agricultural infrastructure, then this land becomes uninhabitable for a civilian population. And if we do that, the population will self-segregate. Most will run, they'll become refugees, and we never have to worry about them again. Anyone who stays, who is under age 55, clearly stayed to fight. And we can shoot them on sight. It's difficult. All right, we've discussed this before. I completely agree. I think it's for different reasons, but I agree. Um, that's exactly what he's doing. Yeah, it, it, it's basically a case of, you know, you're with me or against me. And because you didn't welcome me with bread and salt when I crossed the border, you're against me and you and your family must die. That, and that is kind of what, it, yeah, and that's kind of what's going on here. It's, it's, it's less about... In many cases, you conquer a country not because you want the land and the resources, but you also want the the labor pool that that population represents. In this case, the moment they realized they weren't going to be welcomed, it became the solution of choice to simply cleanse Ukrainians out of Ukraine. 
to get good data on civilian casualties out of a war zone, but the best guess is over 250,000 civilians have been killed to this point. Since he tends to be accurate with these kinds of numbers, I'm assuming, to the best of your understanding, he's probably reads, and I, I, he said this, and it's true, we, we don't know, but does that sound like a plausible or possible figure? Uh, I think it's elevated slightly, but, you know, uh, by a pa factor of 10 to 20 percent, no more than that. Okay. He's out of a war zone, but the best guess is over 250,000 civilians have been killed to this point, and at least a million have been kidnapped and shipped to Siberia, mostly children. The scale of the human devastation is on pace with the Holocaust, but that's the express goal, to eliminate the Ukrainians as a factor. Almost four months ago now. The Ukrainians started advertising that they were going to launch an assault here on what is known as the Kyrgyzstan Pocket. It's the only chunk of territory west of the river that the Ukrainians lost to the Russians early in the war. The Russians saw the advertisements and started moving troops to that pocket, about 20,000 troops in total, in addition to what was already there, their best troops, their best equipment. Now, as we all know, that wasn't the only thing going on. The Ukrainians were watching to see where those troops were pulled from, and they launched a second offensive here in Kharkiv, and the Kharkiv front completely collapsed in five days. The best part of that is you'll notice, you see the city of Lyman just below that, there's a little Dingleberry territory. That's the city of Izium. Izium was their forward deployment base, their forward logistical hub, where they had all of their tanks and all of their ammo and all of their artillery, and it fell in 36 hours intact. In 36 hours, the Ukrainians captured more gear from the Russians than NATO had transferred to them in seven months. They captured more in 36 hours than they had started the war with. And territory changed. We're now in a bit of a holding pattern. It's been mud season until very recently. Can you imagine basically operating a tank in a farm field when it's saturated with fall weather? You don't move. So now that things are freezing solid, we're probably going to see a little bit of movement. And now it's kind of a war of logistics. What we've got here in the south, that's the Kerch Strait Bridge. You'll notice the dotted line. Kerch is the only rail connection between Russia proper and the southern front. And a few weeks ago, somebody blows it up. Which means that anything that the Russians want to bring into the front now has to be moved by truck. Now you guys remember those javelins from earlier in the war? For the most part, the Ukrainians were not targeting tanks or artillery. They were targeting military tactical support trucks, of which the Russians started the war with about 3,000. They're now down to under 800. So they've literally been going town by town in the Russian Federation and confiscating city buses and literally Scooby-Doo vans to move artillery shells around the front. I mean, when a Scooby-Doo van loaded down with artillery shells, like, hits a bump, there's a show. But that's... All right. Um, is this that hyperbole that I was talking about? I mean, it's uh, now obviously um, a Scooby-Doo van is not the ideal, and we all know what he means, and he's being cute and clever. But he's—I uh, don't think he's way off in terms of that. But when how how unstable is transferring artillery shells in a '60s style like van? Uh, how 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 dangerous is that? It, it it's not that dangerous. The you have to understand artillery shells are shipped in separate components. So you have the fusing mechanism with the detonator, and then you have the explosive <laughs> charge in the warhead. If you don't have but, those yeah. two made it up, it's not going to go boom. Yeah, but I mean, you're you're just slashing through the whole uh, transporting things by mystery machine. It's a mystery <laughs> if it'll make it there or not. <laughs> well, very good point, but. That's the thing that bothered me about this particular section of his presentation, is he just doesn't even mention the fact. To keep the war going, the Russians have had to strip all the trucks, the buses, the vans, out of their civilian side to keep the army moving. Can you imagine the impact that is having on their industry? on their economy yeah and it's not just that uh it's not just that ukraine's destroyed all of them i mean a good chunk of them just broke down and they can't fix them yep and and that's not being talked about and 
it's it's like okay, so you managed to take Bakhmut, you know what is it? It's it's literally a salt mine, <laughs> you know. It, it, why does anybody care? Because you've literally destroyed your entire industry to achieve that goal, and it's going to take years, if not decades, to recover from that. Well, the see so, oversimplification. Yeah. It is, yeah. and well, and the and the Scooby Doo van when it when it bumps, you see a show is a great line. I love rhetoric. I love the idea of oh, Scooby, we don't have a Scooby snack, but here's some primer. Would you like to play with that? Um, I, I mean, I think I, I think it's hilarious. It lends itself to some great imagery, and it's great rhetoric. And rhetoric is part of how you sell ideas. I wish it wasn't. We've talked about this. We, you know. Yeah. We sometimes we have on uh, people on in time who we know are are you know uh, for a particular direction or particular point of view, but they have to do that because that's how they get support, and that's how we and you know rhetoric is always a part of every single discussion. As a teacher, that's one of the first things you learn. Good teachers learn rhetoric and have rhetorical skills. The problem is he needs to be taken seriously, incredibly about what he's talking about, uh, assuming his goal is to be well understood and to inform people, which he purports it to be, and presumably it is. When you use even even the my okay, when it hits a thing, there's a show. It's like okay, it's not that dangerous. And again, he's painting the Russians out to be far more incompetent than they are. You've got enough with they're actually having to steal these things and the, what they're stripping from uh, their strategic bombers, stripping from uh, their military, stripping from their civilians in order to get this thing running. You've got enough there. Sitting there and saying that they're complete idiotic morons because. Uh, of the dangers of this kind of, of thing, and that oh my God, we'll be they'll be lucky if they get half of those of those um, uh, artillery shells up to the front, and that's when they're not you know that's when they remember the water. Um, I, I think that's a huge disservice to trying to understand what's going on and to understand the seriousness that the Russians still, you shouldn't underestimate it. They're not fighting the way we'd expect or we'd hope, but they are not a small country, uh, and they are a country willing to keep throwing lives at this it is not as simple as right. you're making it sound yeah but it's also not yeah, but just we throwing also lives at it it's throwing the economy at it as well because again to them this is at least for putin and his inner circle this is an existential battle because if they don't win they're going to be removed with great prejudice we're missing a golden opportunity to sell him maybe some rhetoric. We can make a little money for the channel. You know, <laughs> hey, shipping all these things in the mystery van, it's a mystery as to whether it'll make it or not. <laughs> I think that's great. Oh, I like you, that line. Uh, we're, we'll have our guys call his guys, and we'll be like, okay, dude, we got some one-liners <laughs> for you here. We know <laughs> we know you like them. You've had a few decent ones. You know what? You've done a decent job. Now let the pros take over. Here's how you sell. All right. Here's some good lines. All right. So, um, all right, well, perfect. Well, that, that answers, um, uh, okay, yeah. Uh, the, let's see, that's how the Ru all the Russians have to work with right that's now. all the Russians have to work with right now. Remember, slow-moving forces must be rail supplied. The rail line is offline. This is their only option. So the next phase, what we're going to probably see in the next days to weeks, actually, probably days, they probably started shaping operations yesterday. Is okay, that's another one. They probably started shaping operations yesterday. That triggered me because I'm sitting Remember there going like... Remember when this was originally broadcast? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. This was, so this was broadcast um, uh, less think October. than three months after. It was, it was broadcast a number. He actually gave you the hint when he said, uh, however long ago the rail was destroyed. So figure out when the rail was destroyed and, and work forward yeah. from there. So it was, it was uh, yeah, about, at least it sounds like maybe four to six months ago. It was right before... Things froze enough that they could move. Things were still wet. It was it was a late fall, so this was late fall. But he says down to the day, unless there is it a was, specific event that he knows. It was in it? Yeah. December. Oh, the, oh, December. The original talks were given in December. All right. So unless unless there's a reason that he would know when the the Russian high command or whatever are sitting down, it's like he's just like, oh well, yesterday. And it implies like firsthand knowledge, maybe maybe secret knowledge of what they're talking about or what they're doing that I don't think he has. And Gnosticism. it's 
Yeah, it's a technique that people use to to enhance the perception of their own prowess and understanding of a subject. It's sort of like drop a hint that you know something that you really don't know. But to be able to sit there and say, well, I probably started doing this yesterday is so precise. I'm like, do you actually have any intelligence that would tell you that? Or are you just making that shit up and nobody can contradict you? And it sounds like, wow, he knows down to the day when the Russians get together and do this stuff. So that was my, so we'll put it back, listen to it again as he does it. It's, it's just a, it's, it's a humble brag. He does the other humble brag when he's talking about the CIA. Oh yeah, the CIA called yeah. me and I had to talk to them. It was very intimidating. Show, but that's all the Russians have to work with right now. Remember, slow moving forces must be rail supplied. The rail line is offline. This is their only option. So the next phase, what we're going to probably see in the next days to weeks, actually probably days, they probably started shaping operations yesterday, is this push down straight south. The Ukrainians would love to get all the way to the water. They would love to completely sever the Crimean Peninsula off from all support. But they don't need to. All they need to do is get close enough to some of these roads to introduce the Scooby-Doo trucks. That's not hard. And if you do that, you can make the Crimean Peninsula into a death trap. And that's ultimately how Ukraine might win this war. See, the thing about the Russians is they're so casually inured that the Russians have never accepted terms or sought terms in any war in their history unless they've at first lost at least a half a million men to combat. They fight until they can't. At the moment, the death toll for the Russians is probably between 80 and 90,000. We have a long way to go. But if you cut the rail connection and leave it cut and you can interrupt the supplies, then there's only one thing left to do. This dotted blue line is the Crimea Canal. It is the sole water source for farmland on the Crimean Peninsula. And its sluice gate is in Kyrgyzstan, and the Ukrainians now control it. Well, that's 80% of food production in Crimea that just went offline. Crops they're not going to be able to grow this coming year. If the Ukrainians are going to win this, they're going to trigger a 1980s Ethiopia-style famine in the Crimea, a population of 3 million, mostly ethnic Russians, and the current location of the bulk of Russia's deployable military forces. That's how Ukraine wins. This is and always will be about scale. So We're going to pause there for a second. Uh, you've actually discussed this. You, uh, we discussed this at least six months ago, probably even just shortly after the war that they can, in fact, cut off the bulk of uh, Russian forces if they can take out the bridge, keep Crimea from resupplying it. And what was it that you had said? It, beco it becomes um, uh, like they just turn it into the world's largest POW camp. It's like they basically got everybody. Yeah. Uh, I, I, but, borrowed, I borrowed the phrase from World War II about the Anzio beachhead, which was that it was the largest self-supporting prison of war camp in the world. Exactly. So uh, what he's talking about appears, as uh, to the best of my understanding, to be completely 100% accurate in terms of what you can do, what it would cost, and how it would work. Um, but, the reason, yeah. So well, why don't you fill out the but? To, to me, the big but is, yes, a significant portion of the civilian 3 million population living in Crimea are ethnic Russians. The other portion are ethnic Ukrainians. And I really can't see Zelensky or the Ukrainian military or Ukrainian government agreeing to starve to death perhaps something approaching a half a million Ukrainian citizens to achieve their goals. Aren't I just don't see that. Really, really, we're trying to have a serious discussion. I'm, I'm not, I'm not repeating that. I'm just not repeating that. But we all know, we all know what he thinks about big butts, but we're not going to say it. Um. All right. <laughs> nothing. Um. All right. So, um. To to get back on track. That, that derailment was entirely my fault. I just thought it was amusing. I've been thinking the same thing. All right. Um, so, uh, essentially, and one of the things that you and I talked about, and I, I find frustrating, and you know, we've, we've, we've talked just sort of on the phone, you and I, and I find some of this immensely frustrating. I, I, I would imagine most people do, uh, I, for whatever, get triggered by it. I think it's because I have a hard time separating out what I think should be the practical, what I think should be the reality and what the practical reality actually is. 
you'd think they could send in enough food and water for the civilians, uh, but the military is going to take it, and you will only harm the civilians. It's not until the civilians are out of food and water that you could even have an impact on the, the Russian military, because they will just take it all from the civilians. So there's no, that I can think of, there's no way to implement a plan like this other than essentially what, what uh, Zehan just said here, which is create, uh, create a mass famine on uh, that entire region. And I can't think of a faster way to lose all of the goodwill you've built up as Ukraine by doing that. So, so. Uh, and just to remind people, and we've discussed this before, we don't always say it right now, since they got Kyrgyzstan back, uh, the Ukrainians do have control of the water supply going to about 80% of the staging for uh, for Russia, certainly all this, the staging from that area. Uh, they control the water supply there. They can cut it off. They've been able to do this since they took Kherson. Uh, the problem is the number of civilians that rely on that exact same water, and they can't just turn it off for one group and not the other. So... Um, they're stuck. Uh, yeah. Oh, that's the strategic, that's the tactical. Let's talk about the economic. You take everything in that first column, the belligerents involved, Russia, Belarus, Ukraine, are collectively the world's largest supplier, second largest for the second column, and so on. The folks at the CIA asked me to come present this one slide to them about a month ago. Yeah, 64 words, one slide, deep in the bowels of the agency. That was not intimidating at all. It's like they had all kinds of questions, but they wouldn't answer any of mine. Let me just talk about a few of these real quick. First of all, aluminum and, and titanium. The the Russian system doesn't have any bauxite, so what they do is they import bauxite, they import alumina, the intermediate product that is eventually turned into the metal, and they bring it into the Russian system. Now, when the Russian industry collapsed at the end of the Cold War, all their power generation was left, but all their industry went away. So they had all this extra electricity. So they use that electricity to turn the raw materials into the finished metal, and then they export it. The problem for the Russians is most of the bauxite and aluminum, about three quarters of the total, comes from Australia and Ireland, countries that have said, you know, we're not going to trade with you anymore. So it's in the process of going down. The primary customer for Russian aluminum is Airbus. Then there's titanium. The ore that the Russians export isn't from Russia. It's from Ukraine. The ore is exported to Russia for processing with all that extra electricity. And then the titanium metal is exported. Their primary customer is Airbus. You guys have all heard about Brexit, right? God, what a shit show. Airbus is a consortium of aerospace companies from Spain, France, Germany, and Britain. They all make different parts of the plane. The Brits make the wings and the engine. The Brits are trying to get a free trade deal with the United States. And we've made it very clear, sure, that's great. You gotta ditch Airbus, you gotta join Boeing. <laughs> Which means that the future of European aviation is one without aluminum, titanium, wings, or engines. Russia is not just the world's largest exporter of wheat. Russia is not just deliberately destroying the physical agricultural infrastructure of the world's fifth largest exporter. This space is the single largest supplier of fertilizer as a category, as well as the world's single largest supplier of potash to the world. Already, those exports are down by about one third. And one of the fun things to keep in mind about Russian infrastructure is it is old. Most of the Russian industrial capacity for agriculture was built in the 60s under Khrushchev. And the only reason it still operates today is with a lot of Western tech, duct tape, and help. And that's all stopped. We are already seeing industrial accidents in the Russian energy and agricultural space that are so big in exploding capacity that we can see them from orbit. We sh All right. Um, I'm not a huge fan of that hyperbole. And by the way, uh, Xander, I've muted you. I'm unmuting you, but you have a lot of background noise coming in. So I've been muting you, uh, uh, when that background noise comes in and uh, who knows, I may accidentally forget to unmute. So I wanted to let you know so that, uh, you could either mute it yourself or, or whatever and take care of that. But, um, so, uh, you know, we've seen those accidents. We've been reporting on those accidents. It seems he's, he's right. Uh, that you can see it from space is, again, some of this hyperbole that may be true of some of them. I'm not sure, and I'm not sure that it matters. But fine, if that rhetoric, you know, helps them, you know, get people's attention, great. Um, dear Lord, there was a... I do... Th my, my experience... When I was in the Soviet Union, it was old. I remember getting into an elevator, and the gap between the elevator and the building was huge. You had to walk, and you could easily get stuck. I mean, you could trip on it, get, get probably your toes trapped into the thing, your, your, the whole front of your foot 
trapped in it, and if the door's closed, you'd probably be in some some pretty big trouble. As soon as you stepped on it, the whole elevator shook. You know, the the metal on it was, was would pop just from the weight of it. You'd stand on it, and boom, it would get you know, like, whoa. I'm like, oh, it's fine. Yeah, I think I'll take the stairs. It's all right that we're on the 23rd floor. I needed the exercise. Um, speaking of hyperbole. At any rate, um, but yeah, so let's see. Well, but uh, we've, but we've he is right. I mean, yeah, Khrushchev yeah. did invest an enormous amount of time, effort, and money in trying to bring Russia into the 20th century. And when he was done with that, it stopped. Nobody thought about continuing to invest, continuing to upgrade. It's the same issue we see with the Russian military's trucks. Don't do maintenance on them. That would cost money. All right, so this is this is one where I think we we agree. He really he knows what he's talking about. He's he's not wrong about any of this. Although again, the hyperbole you can see them from space, but yeah, it and I don't know that the industrial accidents. We've been talking about those industrial accidents for some time. It might be sabotage. It might be any number of things. But you would you had brought up more than once that all of their uh, good, all of the men who know how to work the machines are now all on the front lines getting killed. Nobody's operating any of the stuff is so now you're a much greater or, rate of industrial accidents or have fled to foreign countries or uh, bingo exactly all right so uh so yeah here he seems to he, he's he's pretty much got this one uh down should you count on all of this going away we'll come back to that all right let's talk energy this is a pipeline map. The green are oil, the red are natural gas, and the places that matter are these two ports, Primorsk on the Baltic Sea in the north and Novorossiysk on the Black Sea in the south. And it's really all about insurance. You can tell who's from Des Moines, but ooh, insurance. Look to the Des Moineners. Des Moineners, Des Moines, Des Moinesians. You know, I'm from Iowa. I should know this. Anyway. This gets really sexy really fast. So you cannot have your vessel enter a port or exit a port or go into a constrained waterway like, say, the Turkish Straits without an insurance policy. You have to have indemnification coverage. Well, one of the many aspects of the sanctions is that the Europeans, Japanese, and Americans, and that's over 95% of all policies, have said, no, we're not going to insure any Russian flag chartered or owned vessel. The way the Russians are getting around this two-step process. Number one, they form their own insurance. It's kind of sloppy, but it's there. And they're covering ships, shuttle ships, because you can't get a super tanker into these ports. They're too shallow. To run cargo from these ports around Europe to off the coast of Portugal, where step two, the Chinese have rented a half a dozen super tankers, splashed them together into a super raft. And they're doing sea to sea transfers from the shuttle tankers to the raft to additional super tankers who will then do the long circumcontinental trip to the East Asian coast. Now, there are, there are so many ways this can go horribly wrong. Uh, C2C transfers are dangerous in port in calm, protected waters, much less on the high seas. So the environmental risk here is not minor. And in addition, you'll notice that the routes out of these places go by a lot of countries that really don't think very highly of the Russians right now. And since the Russians are the ones doing the insuring, and there's a sanctions regime in place, if you're like, say, Lithuania, and you just wake up and think, you know what, I'm going to fuck with the Russians today. And they just go and they grab a ship. That's a half a billion to a billion dollar payout. And at that point, no one else is going to want to run the route. So not only can you bankrupt the Kremlin, you can wreck their export route. That does a lot more than it sounds like. Because... We'll get to what he's about to say in a second, because I think that's important. But, uh, Commander, your your thoughts on what he just said? Uh, his assessment of uh, this this at sea transfer stuff. Yes, he's very correct on that. It is a very risky operation. Requires a lot of special training. It requires special equipment. And if the Chinese are just simply lashing a bunch of ships together to make a platform for conducting these transfers, it's, yeah, we're talking potential environmental disaster that would make, you know, the, the oil rig and the, the Gulf of the Mexico water, that yeah. caught fire. Yeah, it, it would make that look like, you know, some child spilling their sippy cup in the bathtub. 
So, um, all right. And then actually, I think I had another question, but let's, let's finish up with the, oh yeah. The, do you think there's any other countries that are actually going to fuck with Russia in this way? I mean, I see what he's saying and I think that's interesting. It's still a risk because even you don't want to piss off Russia, even considering everything that's going on. Is Lithuania really going to, going to, you know, turn rogue and pirate a Russian ship? I, 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 that is so absurd of a notion because it literally it's an act of war and the moment lithuania does that because they did that without sanction from anybody else in nato they're effectively removing the umbrella of nato protection from themselves it's like mm -hmm. putting up a big flashing neon sign telling russia yep you can invade us we're open for business so Article 5 can't be triggered because it's purely defensive, right. and if you have fucked with, you just lost that shield. Yeah. All right, so, um, so yeah, I, 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 this is another one of those, it sounds great what he's saying, like, oh my god, anyone could just, because there's this huge payout, it's not that easy, and I don't see any country doing that. He's not entirely wrong, but it's so unlikely, and there's so many reasons yeah. nobody's going to do it, It's it's kind of disingenuous in my view to even bring it up as a possibility all right let's let's continue yeah before you start right. Zanry had something he was trying to say and i i, I stand corrected i confused the uh, ndis it's actually commander mcmillan i've been muting uh and turning on during this so uh, we, we were getting some background noise from you commander earlier but i uh, read it wrong on yeah. the screen uh Xander, did you have anything you wanted to say before we start So you see, no, he, I can he, hear you. Oh, I can't hear him. That's odd. All right. Um, let me uh, let me fix oh. that. There you go. Is Andrew, you're back. Sorry, I couldn't hear you. Don't know why. So I do know why now. So you're not mind. being rude. You're just and over talking me. You just couldn't hear me. Um, yeah, Xandering, uh, whenever you want to talk, um, I, I think your sound is back. Uh -huh. please, continue, yep. uh, please go anytime you want. Of course, go for it. Uh, Somali, we're all listening. Somali pirates aside. Naval interdictions at sea is not nearly as as easy as he made it sound. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I mean, it's it's like the the thought that Lithuania would would have the infrastructure and equipment in place to do, try and do naval successful naval interdictions on Russian ships, uh, especially when Russia knows that this is a possibility uh, and uh, are reliant on these ships. Uh, it's not probably something that's going to happen from Lithuania. <laughs> this is the economic portion where I'm really like, okay, he's really oversimplifying vastly complicated systems. And, and not, to, not to diss on Lithuania, but uh, you, it's, Russia is still a huge threat and they do see this coming. And if you're Lithuania or if you're any other countries that he's talking about here that can do it, and if you're any one of the major, you know, and the U.S. isn't going to do it, so... Um, I, I, yeah, it sounds like what he's saying here is actually essentially BS. Technically it's true, but it's not, no, it's, it's BS. It's not just like, oh, let's get a bit, no, 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 dead. Okay, let's go on. These ports don't have storage capacity. Very. All right, so now he's talking about what hap what happens if anybody starts to mess with this. Let's, let's, let's. Almost like, because these ports don't have storage capacity. Very little. And so if ships stop taking crude away, pressure builds up in the pipes all the way back to the wellhead. And this isn't North Dakota. This is a place that's actually cold. It's permafrost. You guys are all high once you get it. In the winter, as long as you're moving, you're fine. It's when you stop that you die. Same with crude. As it's flowing through that subsurface frozen layer, as long as it's moving, it's liquid. But if it stops moving for any reason, it consolidates into a gel plug, and the water that comes up as a byproduct of all oil production freezes into ice. And when water freezes, it expands. And it pops the pipe from the inside. Now, the last time this happened at scale, it was 1992. The damage was so horrific, it took the Russians 30 years to repair it. And it wasn't the Russians who did the repairs. It was the Western oil firms who are no longer there. We're looking at 4 million barrels per day of Siberian production, Western Siberian production, that is in some degree of danger. If that all goes offline, wow. Oil is not like soy. If you don't get soy, you have wheat or pork or whatever. There are substitutes. If you don't have oil, things stop. So 
the price reflects that. If you need a gallon of gas to get to work and you can only get nine tenths of a gallon, not only will you pay whatever you have to get to that, get that last tenth, the price you pay for that last tenth applies to the entire market in elastic demand. Marginal supplier, marginal demand sets the price. Four million barrels a day goes offline. You're talking 150 to $180 a barrel. Easy. In a very short period of time. Now, that's all else being equal, and the first law of economics is all else is never equal. But that's the scale of what we're looking at here. I can even give you a time when we should look at this very seriously, and that's January 1. Because that's when the sanctions expand from all Russian vessels to any vessel carrying any Russian cargo. Next year is going to be really interesting in many, many, many ways. All right, same. All right, so let's pause that for a minute. We're almost done with the portion of the video. I think we've got a little less than two minutes left, and I may actually end it before. He, he's going to get into Germany, and I think it's interesting, but he, we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. So um, any thoughts on what he just said? Uh, right, well, I, I, I didn't mute his andering this time. Um, no, it, so, it was my <laughs> fault. I was muted. Oh, okay. <sighs> Um, I think he's right on the money with a lot of this stuff. Uh, if, you know, the pipelines freeze up and there's a big problem, they will have their own environmental disaster. And, you know, with all else that's going on, they won't have the wherewithal to clean up whatever that disaster is. Not that the Russians really seem to give a damn about environmental disasters. But, uh, yeah, it's... It's going to be a, a tough haul for them. And trying to move that cargo to keep their economy running, because so much of the Russian economy, the foundation it's all built on is the oil export portion of that economy. When that goes down, everything else comes to a screeching halt. Xander, any thoughts? Uh, you know, I said the, this whole section here on the economics is he's he's dealing with vastly complicated worldwide systems. And it gives you a good idea of what could potentially happen if the worst case scenario in all cases happens. Now, the question of whether that's actually going to happen is questionable, but the the potential is there. And it just seems to me like he's giving it like a worst case doomsday scenario. and and kind of oversimplifying the the real what the real problems are and what can be done to mitigate a lot of that for at least the rest of the world. It may be devastating for Russia, but the rest of the world has the ability to move things around uh, more so than like what he was saying. He's like, it's not like it's soy; you can't find a replacement. It's like you're right; you can't really find a replacement. But there are so many other suppliers, and the the world has a the ability to move some things around. Yeah, and and I. I love the, you know, oh, watch out for January. Things are going to happen in January. That's one thing I've noticed with Zeehan is he makes these really bold predictions of it's happening in the next few days. It's going to happen in, you know, January. It's going to happen in 2025. And then, you know, nobody's ever going to go back and call him on it mm. further down the road. So he can come off really sounding very authoritative when it's just subjective opinion for the most part and and that's the other thing is he also he also always says these things as if they are a fact he doesn't say i believe i think or the evidence is pretty clear that this is going to happen even he doesn't do that he's like this is what's going to happen this is what you're going to see and sometimes there's a caveat if a then b but a lot of times it's sort of like this is the future i have read the future i have prognosticated um call me peter nostradamus i uh, uh it, what, what other authoritarian figures do you know that did that you know like I have here a list of over 50,000 communist yeah. agents in the United States <laughs> yeah. Department of... Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's, this is the part where, and it wasn't until earlier today when I was thinking about what I was going to frame for the show, um, there is a lot I do actually like about the guy. I naturally find people who are intelligent interesting, and I tend to like them, and I think he falls into that category quite easily. I think he, his knowledge is also rather comprehensive, which I like, and it's impressive. 
This is a prepared speech, but it's still nonetheless well done. The problem is when you take the hyperbole and when you take some of the intellectual shenanigans in together, and the, the very first tip off, and I think uh, uh, I think all three of us, because I discussed it with you guys, for me, when he first started talking, I said, well, t the, the facts as I'm hearing them, he seems to be correct on, for the most part, basically all of it. So why do I not like the guy so much? And I finally put my finger on it. The smartest people I have ever met all guard and hedge practically everything they fucking say. And the reason is because one of the things that comes with experience and with learning things is how much you don't fucking know. And the more you learn, the more you realize, oh shit, I really wish I knew 10 times more because I'm starting to realize just how much I don't know. So the smartest people always have to sit and say, okay, yes with an if or no with a but. Um, but, and, and this happens, you know, and on occasion it's frustrating because I'll ask you, Lance, I'll say, listen, could you tell me X, Y, and Z? And you'll say, and I'm kind of looking for a direct answer. I, I'm looking more for the honest <laughs> Not for answer. me, you're not going to get one. <laughs> I'm not going to get it. I'm telling um, you, swords, swords, hands, I'm sick and tired of, but on the other hand. On the other hand, yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, God. We, I think we need to turn that but into a this meme. This brings up a, yeah. Okay, uh, this, this, this brings up a, a pretty good point. Uh, also, uh, not directly related to Peter Zeehan and specifically, but in general, uh, of course, when you talk to people who really know what they're talking about, there usually are quite a few qualifications and it's, you almost feel like you can't get a straight answer out of them. And it's because they recognize that it's like their single mind cannot hold the complexity and entirety of world economics in their head and be able to shift this one thing here. It's almost like chaos theory. And it's like, well, this one little thing here affects so many other things that you may not even realize that it can be masked as well. So there's unintended consequences that you may never even realize are being caused by something else until... So it gets so vastly complicated. But then you have somebody like... Uh, Peter Zeehan comes up and and he seems very authoritative. He authoritative. He makes you know fairly specific things. There isn't any waffling. There isn't much in the way of of qualifications given. You know he's he seems like he knows what he's talking about. He's good at speaking. You know he's correct about uh, at least enough things. And and you're like okay, well that's the person I want to follow because I'm getting what I want, which is a straight answer. You know, and the mm. the reality is is. Most of the time, you don't get straight answers because it's not that clear. Things are just too complicated. There are too many factors at play. And when you introduce people, people don't always do what is rational. I mean, we should know this by now, especially when dealing with this topic. People don't always do what, what we would consider to be rational. So uh, I think that's why you get people similar to, not maybe specifically Peter Zeon, but people like him tend to rise up and get a lot of attention. A lot of people start following him, you know, and, and they get that attention because they seem to be giving, you know, no nonsense, just straight up analysis. This is what's going to happen. This is what you can expect. And people really, really like that. Uh, There's and, and one other aspect that my, my wife pointed out to me, which I thought was really interesting. And it's that Zeon's background is largely academia. Mm. And in academia, you have to be in a position where you can't seem to be doubtful when you're defending your thesis. You have to say, it's this. And, you know, mm. the board is going to say, no, no, it's this. And you can't back down. You have to stand up to all their pressure and say, no, no, I have the right solution. I have the right, correct answer your answers are flawed because of X, Y, and Z. And I think he's falling back on that academia comfort zone in mm. how he does the, this public speaking to some extent. I'm not saying it's the entire answer, but I think it's contributory to the way he presents himself. Well, that's an interesting observation, very much like somebody defending like a PhD thesis or something like that. Um, that's interesting. Uh, well, and Titan, so Titan has said something. So Titan has made his uh, prediction here. So um, Titan's prediction, quote, something will happen in the next two weeks or so to someone somewhere. That from, uh, 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 I'm going to have to say it because it's such a great prediction from Titan Uranus, our head Mahad. Um, thanks. I'm that's, making that's a note helpful. of this just so I can call him on it later. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> exactly. Words of wisdom to live by. 
Mark your calendars, place your bets. <laughs> That's right. All right. Um, all right. So let's uh, let's uh, wrap this up. But I, my hope, and this was the other thing, which was uh, part of me too, as, as we were talking about what our objections are to this guy, um, you know, I was like, well, do we really have to go through the whole thing to, to start to have that coalesce? And the answer is yes, because it's nuanced and it's not easy and nobody wants to just say, well, he's an idiot or full of it because neither of those statements is true, but there are concerns. So, all right, let's, let's wrap this and, up here. And oh, there's yeah, yeah. more than just a kernel of truth to what he's saying. Yes. And I think that's the key. And I, you can't, and I don't want to discount what he's saying in a lot of cases because he's very accurate and it's just how he's saying it that's the issue. Which is why uh, also, too, it's like, I mean, if, if we really thought that he was either a crackpot or a, or a um, like a schemer or, or, or what, you know, we, we do one video and that'd be the end of it. I think his videos are worth watching because he, he's oh, contributing yeah. saliently to the conversation in my view. But in my view, it is actually dangerous to assume that the things that he says are absolute fact are absolute fact because I think he misses some some that we've discussed. So I think he's worth hearing, worth understanding, worth taking with more than a few grains of salt. So, all right. Um, Map, we're going to look at natural gas now. These are the red lines. This is the one that matters. This is Nord Stream. This isn't a marginal supplier to Germany. It's their primary supply. It's 40% of their total demand. And somebody blew it up a few months ago. Germans are not like Americans. I mean, we talk a good paranoid game when it comes to energy security, but we really we don't care where we get our energy. We could get some from Canada, some from Mexico. We make a bunch ourselves. We take some from Saudi Arabia. If we don't think anyone is watching all that closely, we'll take some from Venezuela. Whatever. We don't care. I'm actually going to pause it here because this gets too much into Germany, and I think it's its own topic, and I don't think we're prepared to really go into what he says here about Germany. I will say one thing I did like. Um, it... I dislike when especially American political um, or, or geopolitical uh, analysts or commentators give the U.S. a free pass on some of its own BS. Um, and, I, uh, you know, it's also a way to boost your credibility to say, hey, I'm not giving them a free pass. But um, he's not he's not throwing the U.S. under the bus and saying that the U.S. is a terrible country for doing things. He's like, yeah, when people aren't looking, we go to, we go to Venezuela. It's just like, yeah, you know, um, it, it's a problem, and we should look into that, but he ain't wrong. And um, and he ain't wrong that we wait until nobody's low. We know what we're doing. We're not, we're not, um, yeah. So uh, that part I actually very much liked, and so... Uh, Here's what I'd like to do. I'd sort of like to, to uh, run down. I'd like to um, start as Andering. If uh, you have any thoughts or comments and wrap up your overall opinion, I think you had heard of uh, Peter Zehan before we started this, but um, I think you've been researching it. And you've got some ideas. So I'd, I'd like to hear sort of your your overall view of him and or uh, what he said in this video. And I'll ask Commander McMillan the same, and then we'll uh, wrap it up. So uh, any thoughts as Andering? Yeah, I, I've seen several of his videos, and one of the, I like the way that he speaks. As far as you know, he puts it all out there. Uh, he gets quite a lot of things right. I, I have one of his books, uh, you know, talking about post globalization, how you know, kind of globalized eco economic model is collapsing and it's falling apart, and we're going to go much more to to regional economic trade versus this uh, such globalism. And of course, he gets into a lot more into China and. and the Southeast Asia than he does. Well, I mean, he does in this talk too, but this particular section. So it's like, I've, I've heard quite a lot of it. And I think that he's worth listening to because, you know, he can lay out at least kind of sort of most of the fundamentals nice and accurately. You know, and then he goes through and he, you know, kind of gives a very clear cut, very oversimplified view. You know, and in many cases you might need that over, oversimplified view, you know, so that you're not drowning in the minutia of the details uh, I, I think he's great to listen to as a point of view. I wouldn't recommend listening to only him either. He's, it's one of those things that, you know, he sh I think that he should be on people's radars to get, okay, what is what is Zihan's view of this? Okay, that's interesting because he brings up a lot of interesting points. And then what does this person say or what does this person, you know, go and listen to other people as well, preferably ones that have dissenting opinions, you know, because they, they bring up good points to each other. And I think it if you were to do that, you can get a really good, clear view of, of what's 
happening currently and what may be likely to happen, kind of where we're going. You know, and I think that overall, like his overall trajectory saying, hey, look, these are what the problems are going to be uh, coming forward, maybe not necessarily on the exact timelines that he's saying, but I think that you know he does bring up very good points about what kinds of things are going to be a problem moving forward. So you know, I've, I've always liked listening to him, uh, but not the only person that I would listen to. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, Lance, uh, your views. Pretty much said what needs to be said, I think. Uh, as I opened with our, my comments about the guy, I think he, he really knows his stuff. Uh, he's well-spoken. His credentials are impeccable. But, you know, there, there's just a, a tendency on his part, I think, to overstate or to use hyperbole more often than he really ought to be doing so. So it's one of those, and there are a lot of guys like this, I think, on the Internet, where you have to take what they say with a, a grain of salt. And I mean a grain of salt, not like, you know, when Fox News is broadcasting where you need <laughs> an entire dump truck load full of salt. So I, I'm going to say more than a grain, but I agree with you. I, I don't think... Um... You know, I, I, so, so my view is, is roughly concurrent, uh, with all of yours. I think he, uh, really does know what he's talking about. And he's, he's clearly got the pedigree in the background. And there are people who have the pedigree in the background and who are complete idiots. He's not one of them. Uh, but I, I my concern is it, it seems somewhat dangerous the way he approaches it. And the reason is because, um, there are very few things in life that have simple answers and he's offering very simple answers and explanations to reasonably complex things. And I think they ignore details sometimes that are important. And, um, so I think his level of confidence is probably, uh, it may just be out of academia or that may in fact be contributing to it, but it wouldn't surprise me. That at reminds least if it me wasn't. of something when you get done. All right. It wouldn't surprise me if, um, at least in part, it was because that's how you book rooms and you, you know, you, you get full audiences in, in, uh, large halls and spaces and how you get to be YouTube famous. And again, that's perfectly fine. But, uh, that level of confidence, I've seen other people quoting his stuff. So, and I, I, I recognize it instantly because I've seen enough of his stuff now. I know what he's saying. So when somebody says this, I was like, oh, I know where you got that from. And my concern is they're parroting him back. But since they don't know how he gathered the information and how he reached his conclusions, um, if it's all dead wrong, they will not be swayed because, well, this man that's smarter than all of us has gone out and said it. And he's clearly quite confident. And uh, just as, in fact, a, 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 a part of this, uh, which I think is probably irresponsible unless he knows something that I don't know, um, our next video that we're going to be covering is his uh, take on China. And it's an interesting take. I think it's actually even somewhat more interesting than this one, but we did this one first because this is more uh, present with material that InTime is already covering right now. But his take on China... Uh, starts with the prediction that China will not survive the end of this decade. So by the end of the 2020s, China will be gone. It will not exist as a country anymore. That is one of his predictions. He does make a lot of these predictions, and his is there is no way China, it's already over, in fact. China doesn't realize it, but it's already over. You can, you know, write the checks, do the whatever. It's done. China's done. And I don't think that's true. <laughs> I really don't think that's true. And predictions like that have been made about the U.S., other countries before, and on occasion they're right, uh, but that kind of thing. So we're going to get into that, but running around believing that th his level of confidence reflects the accuracy of what he's saying, I think is um, counterproductive to uh, understanding these issues, education on these issues, being informed voters on these issues, and overall can be detrimental, despite the fact he also has a lot of very good information 
and makes some points that are very much worth considering. It's just where he comes across and almost puts himself off as the guy who just knows it all. You just sort of see him as another guy who's pretty well educated and really does have some pretty good ideas about what he's talking about, but is just another guy as fallible as everybody else. I would be much more comfortable with him presenting himself that way, and I'm inherently suspicious of anybody who doesn't. So, yes, Zandring, you're you had one other thought, and then we will... Uh, yeah, and it kind of, I guess, there was always kind of something that niggled at me, and I, I kind of chalked it up to just oversimplifying vastly complex issues and then making predictions off of that simplified view. And, you know, the, the several times it's been brought up that, you know, he's coming from an academic background, and it, and it kind of, I guess, clicked. It's like if you're coming strictly from an academic background, and are looking at all these things and you're analyzing all of these things, well, of course, you're going to come to a lot of these conclusions and, and things are going to be a little bit more simple because in academia and when you're looking at all of these things, things tend to work a lot cleaner. When you get out into the real world, and I've seen this in trucking all of the time, when you get out into the real world, it's like, okay, your classroom theories on how all of this should work completely fall apart when you actually put it into practice in the real world. You know, they don't actually hold up. Things don't work the way that you think that they should, even though on paper it makes a lot of sense. And you're like, oh, I can make this argument and I can defend this argument until you actually go and do it. So it makes it sound like he he's just looking at this as an academic problem and not going out and actually experiencing what all these different industries are doing and what they have to put up with and all of the things that fail when they're trying to implement it in, in the real world because things, you know, don't quite work the same so i i, I kind of get that feeling especially you know listening to some of your objections to to things it seems to make a little bit more sense to me that you know well from an academic view i guess this this makes a lot of sense and i don't think it's not worthwhile to take a academic view of things because you can at least get a handle on uh, start to get a handle on on the things that are going on but once you get into the real world and how it actually works things don't usually hold up so well I think that's um, another excellent point. All right. Well, um, so the schedule for those of you uh, who are uh, interested, a, a week from today, we uh, everything, uh, assuming we can gather the panel once again, which we're hoping to do, a week from today, same time, we will be doing Zihan's video on why China will not survive the decade. Uh, we will also... Uh, let's see. I don't think we have anything planned tomorrow, unless I'm, I'm missing something. We do have downtime with um, uh, Lance and I planned for a Thursday. On Friday, we will have Operator Starsky on to discuss what's been going on in the Ukraine. And I think we're definitely going to we're going to talk a little bit more, um, uh, uh, Xandring and I, on some of that footage uh, from the the shooting, uh, the guy who was just wildly shooting through his car at the at the tailgater, uh, because I think as Andrew brought up a lot of points about that that are worth discussing. Um, it's more nuanced than I had thought about, um, and he he just brought up a lot of good points as to why, as bad as I thought it was, it's probably even worse. So uh, we'll be discussing that at, at some point in the near future, a couple of other topics that we've been working on. I would really like to thank all of you who um, I've been seeing the back end and uh, so many people were hitting the thumbs up button. People have been subscribing. Uh, we used to do all our content on one channel. We've added a second and we're doing a second simply so that people who just want the news, they can go to the news channel. People who want the interviews, who want the discussions can go to the other channel. And on occasion, we'll show content on both. That's appropriate. We'd like to do less of that right now. We just need overtime to, to, to get up to a thousand as quickly as possible. So I can catch up to in time in terms of what we can do on that channel. That's it. And you guys have really been helping. I sincerely appreciate that. So thank you all for listening to, to, I, I hate shilling that stuff and you guys have been been really great about it. so thank you uh thank you is entering for coming i am so glad i'm so glad we were able to get the audio to work this time i'm gonna have to figure out why it's working and fix that problem because you know frankly anyways um thank you is entering very much for coming it was it was good to see you uh, and sorry we weren't able to get you on the last one okay i don't have no, it's always great to be here wasn't me. He's just, he's, he's pausing. He's taking his time. No. He wants to have a considered response. You, 
You usually no, usually it's like I get my last things in and you give your you know farewells and hurrahs and it's all right, there we go. It's I'm a little shocked that I'm I'm being thanked. So and and to respond to it, it's just a little I wasn't expecting it. I had got it's, it when I had muted myself ready for the end of the show man. and and he, and he threw me a loop. All right. No, well, it's, it's yeah, great. Well, I love being it's, here. It's, I, I love I love I love making things exciting and unique on this show. You know, next time I may even, you know, straight up ask you a question and, and be interested in the answer as opposed to just like, oh God, he's gonna talk about the Second Amendment again. Uh, oh thank you. Your tease. Stop it. Yeah. That's never gonna happen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Zandrick knows me too well. All right, uh, Lance, thank you as well so oh, much you for coming. Kids. <laughs> yeah. Take care. Uh, you too, sir. Thank you all very much, and we look forward to seeing you uh, on Thursday night with. Um, uh, wow. So I'm just Commander McMillan. It's not Mount. It's like, uh, so we can say uh, Commander Reverend Dr. Lance McMillan. Uh, on on uh, Thursday field night. Marshall, field Marshal, Field Marshal, Field Field Marshal, uh, pain in the ass, McMillan, Thursday night. <laughs> well, yeah, uh, definitely that. Operator Starsky on uh, a Friday, and our follow up to this show, we will be discussing Peter Zihan's uh, views on China next week at this time. Thank you all so much for joining us. See you in a couple of days. Good night. <laughs>